for it TV. The world is thinking. Good evening and welcome to our Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley program brought to you from the Coverly Theater in Palo Alto. My name is Colleen Wilcox and it is my pleasure to introduce Christopher Hitchens, contributing editor and columnist for Vanity Fair magazine, media fellow at the Hoover Institute and author of God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons everything. As a foreign correspondent and travel writer, Christopher has written from more than 60 countries on all five continents. He began his journalistic career in 1973 as a magazine staff writer in London and immigrated to the United States in 1981. For 20 years, he wrote a bi-weekly column called the Minority Report for The Nation. And he also served as Washington editor and columnist for Harper's Magazine. Christopher continues to write regularly in publications like the Atlantic Monthly and Slate and has offered, authored several books including Letters to a Young Contrarian and Why Orwell Matters. On his 58th birthday, Christopher became a U.S. citizen on the steps of the Jefferson Memorial. And some of his most memorable Vanity Fair columns include his year-long personal makeover and firsthand experience waterboarding. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Christopher Hitchens. Thank you, Angel, for that suspiciously <coughs> terse introduction, <laughs> grudging introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, brothers and sisters, for coming. Um, I apologize for the spider bite that makes me limp in this uh, cretinous way to the podium, but this is part of the price that one pays for the mid-peninsula idyll at this time of year. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that the subject uh, of course, I'd like to think that it was the, the speaker, but I would also hope that it was the subject had magnetized you here, unless it is that on such a beautiful evening, you don't really have anything No, no that can't possibly be. <laughs> Even I, spider-bitten as I am, I'm not as lame as that. No, look, this is a grave moment, and it's a time to revisit a, a phrase that became a cliché, a little while ago in the hands of our last president, uh, the concept of the axis of evil, and my claim to expertise on this is simply that I am, as far as I know, the only writer to have sampled the different conditions of these three uh, regimes, or samples of regime. Uh, the, the kind of government, as I, I'll start right out by phrasing it, um, considers the citizen essentially to be the property of the state. Uh, the danger that that sort of government poses, not just to its own people or to its neighbors, but actually to, to the civilized world order. And the discrepant forms in which that takes, sorry, the discrepant forms which that takes, and in which one might have to think about it and possibly even think about um, confronting it. And we only have about an hour, I'm told, together, and you can count on me to do most of the talking, or at least that's what I aim to do, either Q&A or directly addressing you. But what I, what I want to do is take no more than the first half, just to give you an idea of what these systems are like and why you should, why you should mind, and why you should take an interest. Um, I suppose I'll start with, the, with, the, with Iraq, um, which was best described by, has best been captured by under its old regime form, 
a brilliant author, an Iraqi English, half Iraqi, half English author called uh, Kanan Makia, who had to write for a long time under a protective pseudonym of Samir Al Khalil and wrote a, a, a tremendous book called The Republic of Fear, which is the best uh, forward description that one could have of the regime of, of Saddam Hussein. If you can get hold of it, and you can, if you go back to look at the uh, program that Kanan Makia and Hodding Carter once did for uh, public broadcasting, you can actually get to see one of the most chilling, annihilatingly chilling, actually, videos ever made in the 20th century. It shows the moment at which Saddam Hussein, the actual moment at which Saddam Hussein uh, seized power in Iraq for himself. Um, we don't have that moment in uh, Germany. We don't have that moment in Russia. We don't know the, we know what happened after the Kirov assassination in, in Leningrad and the opportunity it gave to Stalin to seize supreme power. We know roughly what happened in the night of the Long Knives when Adolf Hitler realized that he could massacre every rival of his in, not just in German politics, but within his own party, which is always the crucial thing. But with, with Iraq, we do have the actual moment, and you see it. The, the, the Central Committee of the Ba'ath Party, perhaps 100 people, are sitting in a very formal array in a conference room. And Saddam Hussein is chairing them from a podium, smoking a large cigar. And suddenly, without warning to anyone, in is dragged between two guards and in chains a, a broken man, a man who is obviously physically and mentally been utterly uh, destroyed. His personality has been evacuated. And uh, prodded a bit, he stumbles through a confession uh, that implicates himself and others um, in a plot to destroy the Iraqi Republic, to remove the regime of the Ba'ath Party, and to um, uh, ruin the Iraqi revolution, the, uh, the counter-revolution, in other words. He says the, the regime behind it is the Syrian regime. It could have been anybody. It could have been international Zionism. It could have been anything you like, but he actually implicates, in this case, the Syrian, the Syrian Ba'ath Party rivals. Having confessed for himself and having begged to be executed for his crimes, and having been reduced to a state of complete abjection, the man then says, the following members of this central committee were with me in this plot, and he begins to read out their names. Slowly, <clears throat> and as this happens, you can see it. The uh, guards move every time a name is mentioned, and they, they grab the member of the central committee and lead him out of the door. And after about a dozen of these, the, there's panic. Uh, sheer animal panic starts to spread among those who haven't yet been named, and in the in the hope that they're not going to be. They start screaming and jumping up and saying, glory to Saddam Hussein, our leader, all praise to him, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars of Iraq, um, praying that it won't be them who are called next. Nothing, nothing makes any difference. The, the harvest just goes on randomly. They're taken off the chessboard and taken out until half of them are gone, and the rest are just limp and done for and, and almost dying with relief that it wasn't them. Uh, it's the most extraordinary uh, live show of a, of a real for keeps political purge that you'll ever see. And then there's the second half, uh, which has been seen by much fewer people and was not shown on PBS, uh, where the surviving half are told to go out in the yard and are given guns and are told to shoot the convicted half. Now they're in the plot. Now, they're, now they are cemented to the leadership. Now, Kanan Makir in his book says correctly, he says, Hitler wouldn't have thought of that. <laughs> Stalin didn't even think of that, and he thought about these things a lot, <laughs> about how to get mem one member of the Central Committee to betray another member and keep them all guessing so that you're the ultimate beneficiary. But, but this is that added little touch of sadomasochistic genius. This is the adding of the Godfather and the Soprano um, to the mixture of Nazism and Stalinism that was, in fact, the birth of Ba'athist ideology to begin with, in case you don't know or haven't studied it. The Iraqi Ba'ath Socialist Party was modeled in large part on admiration for European national socialist and fascist movements, 
hope to emulate them, <clears throat> especially in their nationalism against the West. But mutated by Saddam Hussein, it became um, also one that very, very much admired. He had a great admiration for and grew a special mustache in admiration of uh, the work of Joseph um, Vissarionovich uh, Dugiashvili, the great Georgian known to us historically as Stalin. So you had in, in modern Iraq a, a regime in, in our own time that was, that was openly and directly modeled upon um, the two most extreme examples of European totalitarianism. And when I used to go there in those days, it's often very difficult when you come out of a country like this to explain to people quite what it's like when you're there, um, the atmosphere of terror, the, the look that comes into people's eyes when you mention the name of the leader, the absolute look of flash of panic. Uh, anything could happen to me now. Um, uh, the person who spills their cup of coffee in the morning on a copy of the party paper that has the leader's picture on it, and everyone in the cafe goes completely quiet. You just desecrated a picture of the leader. The police are on their way now. You've just made the biggest mistake of your life. And it's very likely that your family will go to prison with you. And maybe they'll have to watch you being tortured. And if they do, they'll have to applaud. And if they have to watch you being executed, they'll be later sent a bill for the bullets that were used to be fired into the back of your head and your neck because no one's exempt. And it's often, I think, very, very, very hard for people who live in civilized countries, democratic countries, to, to understand what it would be like to live even a day um, under a regime that was like this. I used, to re I used to find in arguments about Iraq that I knew right away um, when someone didn't know what they were talking about. And the dead giveaway would always be when they would say, all right, I agree, Saddam Hussein is a bad guy. I said, that means you don't know, you don't know anything about it, if that's what you think. You don't know what it would be like to be sitting at home wondering where your daughter was and finding out because the police came around and banging on the door handed you a video while they stood there of her being raped by their colleagues just to show you who was boss. The word evil, which I began with, I think does need a bit of justification. Uh, many people think that just use, even use the word evil is sort of naive or, or morally too judgmental or um, you know what I'm driving at, uh, too simplistic. And yet it's somehow a word without which we cannot do. Hannah Arendt in her study of totalitarianism borrowed from Immanuel Kant the concept of radical evil, of evil that's so evil that in the end it destroys itself. It's so committed to evil, it's so committed to hatred and cruelty that it becomes suicidal. Um, my definition of it is the, uh, the surplus value that's generated by totalitarianism. It's, it means you do more violence, more cruelty than you absolutely have to to stay in power. You've already made your point. You've done everything you, you need to do to make people realize that you're in power, but you somehow can't stop. There has to be a, a special appetite. There must be special prisons for rape. There must be special graves, mass graves, just for children. Uh, there must be the desire to see how far you can go. And even if you know this will in the end bring retribution, it's worth it in some sense, for its own sake. Maybe that's the only redeeming thing about it. Maybe the irrationality uh, is, the, is the one saving a grace of it. But at any rate, it's not a word, it seems, that we can abolish from our vocabulary. If you doubt me, just ask any liberal how they're going to vote at the next election, and they'll always say it's for the lesser evil. Uh, somehow the word is necessary, even in a relativistic term. Um, I haven't started with, with Iraq. Uh, I haven't begun to tell you what it's like. Um, the nearest I can come from personal experience would be, I suppose, uh, being present when a mass grave uh, in the Shia districts of the south was being opened. Um, Hila, near Babylon, um, just after the intervention in 2003. And I was there. I'd, I'd gone with a group of my fellow reporters and. Um, the temperature in Iraq at midday at around that time goes well above 100, and you have to be coated in sunscreen at all times, and you're coated in sweat anyway. And it gets in your hair and in your clothes and on your face. You're, you're sort of covered in slime, in effect, protective slime. And that's fine until the wind gets up a bit as the mass grave is being excavated, and you find that you're being 
uh, covered in a coat of powder, gray powder, which is made of people. It's the, the, the filth and the smut of people who've been buried en masse for a long time, are just being dug up and are being now blown around in a, in a gray cloud. And you, if you want to feel dirty, if you want to feel dirtied up by the experience of fascism, try finding that you're 12 hours away from a shower and you can't get dead person out of your hair or off your face. There's nothing you can do about it. You're stuck with it. You're tainted. You're polluted and you're living in a country, or visiting a country in this case, which is digging itself slowly out of a, a, general, a generalized mass grave. So that was Iraq for very nearly um, 40 years. Um, as I say, I've only time for thumbnail sketches uh, this evening, vignette. Um, North, I wrote a piece from North Korea called uh, Visit to a Small Planet, which is a line I stole from a, a play of Gore Vidal's because it did seem to me as if I had left this planet completely to go on this visit to the northern part of the Korean Peninsula, and that I, it was as if coming back from another, another spatial body altogether. And the article got, I have to say, for myself, uh, a lot of praise, um, and a lot of good reviews, and a lot of uh, notice. And every time I got praised for it, I used to feel slightly uh, congealed, slightly nauseated, uh, because I knew that of all the articles I've ever written as a foreign correspondent, it was probably the greatest failure. I had not got near to describing for an American audience what it would be like. By the way, we know where your children go to school. <laughs> um, what it would be like to be a North Korean even for a day. Um, and I'm not sure I can try it even now. I'll give it a shot. Uh, my friend Martin Amis wrote a book called The War Against Cliché, which is The War on Cliché, saying that, um, as all of us who write and think and speak, try to remind ourselves there's nothing worse than using borrowed phrases. There's nothing, once you've said the heat was stifling, she was rummaging in her handbag, to win two Nobel Prizes was no mean achievement. So once you're using someone else's words, and that's part of literary intellectual death. So we try and avoid it. So when I went, I'm reeling back a little here, just to spoodle back. When I went to Czechoslovakia under the old communist regime one day in the uh, 80s, I thought to myself, whatever I do, whatever happens to me in Prague, I'm not going to use the name Kafka. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> I won't do it. It's so easy. Everyone else does. I'm not going to. I'll write the first non-Kafka mentioning piece. <laughs> so I went to this meeting of, of this then unknown dissident, uh, Václav Havel, and various of his Czech friends and Slovak friends in a, an apartment in Prague. And we thought that no one knew that he had these visitors coming from America. And so, but oh, someone must have given us away because... It wasn't long before the door fell in and in came police dogs and guys in leather coats and um, carrying heavy electric torches and truncheons and so on, slammed me up against the wall and said, you're under arrest and you've got to come with us. And I said, I thought of saying, I demand to see the ambassador. And I said, well, on, what's the charge? And they said, we don't have to tell you the charge. And I thought, fuck. <laughs> now, now, I, now I do have to mention Kafka. Totalitarianism is a cliché. Dictatorship is based on, on clichéd thinking, on very tried and tested uniform stuff. They don't mind that they're boring. They don't mind that they're obvious. They, their point is made. And I thought, now you've made, now you're going to make me do it. Well, multiply that by as much as you can, and you have um, the following surmise. I went to North Korea, finally got in, Took me a long time, had to go under a second identity, had to pay a huge bribe, I was there, I got, I got there. And I thought, I know what I'm not gonna say about North Korea. I'm not gonna say it. That school children are marched to school carrying pictures of the dear leader and the great leader. The loudspeakers speak of nothing but the great leader and the dear leader. Uh, at workplaces there are uh, sessions 
set apart every day for cries of hatred against the United States and the West and South Korea, I'm still not going to do it. They won't make me say 1984. They just won't make me do it. <laughs> but eventually they make you do it. The, you have to, it, it, your mind just adjusts to it. The North Korean state was founded in 1950, 51. That's the year 1984 was published for the first time. You think, could it be that someone handed a Korean translation of this <laughs> to Kim Il-sung and said, do you think we could make this fly? And he said, <laughs> page through, he said, I don't know. But we could sure give it the old college try. Because that's what it looks as if they did. There is no private life for a North Korean. There isn't a moment when you are not either on parade or when you're not on parade, told to stay in, indoors. You're not wanted, stay at home, you're under curfew. Lights are out in Pyongyang, and that's the capital city, um, at 8.30. Can't go out after that, stay, stay in. There's nothing to watch, there's nothing to see. All television programs, when it's working, are all about the dear leader, as are all operas, uh, all films, um, all concert performances, and all public lectures. There's nothing else to talk about. Um, the, the, the life of the human being, this is what I failed to convey in my article, is completely pointless. There's, there's the concept of, of liberty or humor or irony or happiness or love doesn't exist. You are, you are there simply as a prop for the state. And though it used to be, as with any slave system, that they would feed you in return for your services, uh, that compact broke down a couple of decades ago. Uh, now they don't feed you either. Um, they, don't, they barely clothe you. Um, uh, at Panmunjom, the so-called demilitarized zone, you've seen the word demilitarized zone, haven't you, in the press, even quite recently. Why do they call it demilitarized zone? Words lose their meaning so fast. It's the most militarized zone on the planet. Uh, there are nuclear mines sown in that DMZ. There's a concentration of force and violence on either side of it that is unequaled anywhere. It's the most militarized zone in the world. That's the only place where North Korean and South Korean soldiers meet directly face to face, across, staring at each other across the table. They change guard about five or six times a day. The North Koreans naturally put up their best soldiers to stand there, to put the best, bra bravest, toughest face on North Korea. The best ones they can find are six inches shorter than the South Korean ones now. That's what a famine state is on top of a slave state. We now have millions and millions of North Korean children totally stunted in mind and body who will have to be dealt with at some point, who have been raised to believe that they live in a, a regime that is uh, run by a, a god. And I, here I must just indicate, but I was going to do this later, but I'll say it now. There's, there's a thing that it took me ages to notice about reading George Orwell's 1984. I wrote a book about it. I've written many articles about it. It took me a long time to notice something that's so obvious that it's crying to be said. In 1984, it's assumed there's no more religion. There's no church in 1984, not even a tame state church. There's nothing. No one mentions the idea of faith, except in Big Brother. Quite interesting. It's, it's as if it's in, an entirely secular dictatorship. In North Korea, you might think that was the case, since it has an officially communistic ideology, but it's not. It's the most religious state it's possible to imagine. Um, it's actually two, uh, it's two people who have been fused into one. Maybe this is reminding you of something. There's the, there's the father and there's the son. It's one short of a trinity. Um, another way of phrasing it is this. Um, when the president, our president, writes to Kim Jong-il, the son, the dear leader, he doesn't call him dear Mr. President. He calls him dear Mr. Secretary. You ever noticed that? Why is that? Because he's not the president of North Korea. He's the head of the Communist Party, the North Korean Workers' Party, and he's the head of the army. He's not head of the state. The head of the state is his father, who's been dead for 15 years. So it's a necrocracy, if you like. <laughs> or a mausolocracy, or a, a thanatocracy, in which the one has been fused into being with the other, and where both of them are said to have had miraculous births, attended by miraculous uh, phenomena, such as, for example, birds singing in Korean when they were born. <laughs> so that th this is the, possibly the most theocratic country 
as I've ever seen, or that there has ever been, where the only duty of the citizen, starving and stunted and enslaved, as he or she may be, is the worship of the leader and of the, of the leader's father. I'm not quite sure how far I've trespassed on my time, and maybe someone would give me a wave. One hours. <laughs> You're so good. Well, <clears throat> I should say a few words about Iran, which is um, the one I've visited most recently, and which is maybe the one that's nearest the front of our minds. The Iranian people um, were converted to Islam <clears throat> not very much longer after the uh, conquest of the Arab world by Islam, but they refused to adopt the Arabic language, and it's a great point of pride to them that Persian culture and the Persian language and Persian literature survived the conversion to Islam, and the conversion to Islam also was, for, them, for most of them, uh, not the Sunni majority uh, form, but the Shia one. So there's a great discrepancy between Iranian society and many other of what we think of as Arab Muslim uh, states and systems. Um, and there are many, many, many discrepant views within the Shia theology about what's the proper role of religion in society or in the state. Should it rule now? Should it claim to govern people in the here and now? Or should it wait until the Messiah, the 12th Imam, comes back and would it only be then appropriate for religious rule uh, to bring a, about a world of universal justice and uh, vindication. This is a very live argument in Iran and among Iranians and has been for a very long time. But since the advent of the Ayatollah Khomeini, sometimes called the Iranian Revolution of 1979, I would say myself the Iranian counter-revolution since the entire uh, people of Iran and every layer of Iranian society took to the streets to overthrow the Shah, only to find that their revolution had been taken from them and hijacked by a clerical caste who then used violence against all those who had uh, helped them to overthrow the Shah and imposed a dictatorship of their own. I believe that's more better described as a counter-revolution than a revolution. There was a revolution anyway. But ideologically, the version of totalitar totalitarianism I'm talking about here has a religious name. Unlike Iraqi, Iraqi Baathism or Kim Il-Sungism, it has a directly mainstream religious name. It's called the Velayati Faqi, the, the guardianship of the jurist or the cleric. Originally invented to say that orphans, uh, children, mad people, uh, lost people were to be looked after as wards of the state. Khomeini decided that this Velayat should be extended to everybody. Everyone in Iran is now considered to be a child with a paternal authority vested in the Guardian Council and the Supreme Leader. And they're, they're, they should, they're supposed to be grateful that they can never, uh, for a moment, uh, not be afforded this wonderful protection. Uh, the father who will never go away. Um, the father who will never quit caring for them. Um, it's ironic, I think, that this should be the case in, in Iran, and I think that those who proposed the idea and kept it going for the last two decades failed to notice something exactly to do with paternity. <clears throat> the Iranian people lost, we think, at least a million, maybe a million and a half young people in the terrifying war that they waged with Saddam Hussein. Um, in order to make up the numbers, after this very depleting war, the Ayatollahs promised Iranian mothers very large subsidies if they would breed more children, which they did. Um, if you had a large family, four or five, you would get a, a great deal of state subsidy. The, the consequence is what I call a, a baby boomerang. There are now, we think, probably more than 50% of the Iranian population is under 25. And it's rather outgrowing the tutelage of parenthood. Um, and so the mullahs have, by accident, by unintended consequence, brought about a generation that doesn't like them. In particular, in particular uh, among the females. So that the moment is coming, I think it may already in fact have come, when the Velayati Faki will no longer work. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the, the, the appearance of an open society uh, not an open society, but a, a relatively open one when compared with Saddam's Iraq or North Korea, 
but where all is allowed, but all is guided, and all is finally decided by a guardian council, um, has reached the point that Lenin described, <coughs> excuse me, the, the point that Lenin used to describe as a revolutionary situation, viz, a situation where the old order cannot continue in the old way, is unable to do so, and where those whom it rules do not wish, have no further desire to be ruled in the old way. So the crisis of totalitarianism with which I began um, is now where I'll stop, because I've just got the relevant signal. Uh, and to say that there is, and we, we must hope that this is a constant finding, uh, we, we may be flattering ourselves as mammals and primates, um, but it could be that there is something incompatible between us and our needs and our desires and our nature and the idea of a human system uh, that can uh, guarantee everything, uh, that can control everything, uh, that can know everything, um, and that can control and know and run everybody. And on that hope, we must uh, repose our own hopes. So thank you for being my prisoners, and I look forward to being your hostage in the next uh, half. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Saum, and I'm the managing editor of Santa Clara Magazine. And I have the privilege of moderating your questions tonight, of which there are many, many, many. Um, and I, many of them having to do uh, right with where you left off, Christopher. Uh, are you hopeful about what's happening in Iran right now? Yes. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, contact with Iran through former students of mine, <clears throat> friends of mine, uh, through the email system. Um, there was a wonderful photograph this week of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards going house to house in Tehran and, and piling up satellite dishes, which they'd smashed, in the back of their trucks. Lots of luck to them. <laughs> it's too late. In Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, it was death to possess a satellite dish, and people didn't. It was too risky. For a while, it was death to possess a typewriter <coughs> because it meant you could type out something twice and pass it on. It worked, in fact. Iran is too big. Um, Tehran is too big. It's filled with, swollen with immigrants who are fleeing the, the countryside. Large illegal population, huge subversive student population. I'm, I'm delighted to see they keep on trying to smash the satellite dishes. It won't work. I, I hardly know any Iranian who doesn't have, because of the exile, the diaspora, at least one relative overseas. Most people know how to make an international phone call, even when they try and block the cell phones. Um, the stupider the regime, the more intelligent the people get, and the more humorous. <laughs> We're going to live to see great things in Iran. And in the meantime, for me, you know, the most wonderful thing is this. They've raised a generation of people who've completely seen through religion. <laughs> they've, got, they've got no more use for these verminous mullahs at all. It's a wonderful thing to see. So a, a number of questions ask, what do you think U.S. policies should be toward Iran and uh, in conjunction toward, toward North Korea? Some folks, of course, worrying about an Obama administration uh, that would... Um, be more likely to fall uh, victim to appeasement? Well, the problem is this. There are two, tr uh, not tracks, there are two clocks ticking in Iran. One is the democracy movement clock, which is ticking now faster than it was, but it's got a lot of catching up to do. And the regime, remember, still has the monopoly of violence. And the Basiji and the goons who they employ may only be f uh, represent 5 to 10 percent of the population. I'm sure not more, but they do have a lot of force at their disposal, and they're very ruthless. Um, and then there's the clock that's ticking towards a nuclear weaponry, towards where these same goons will have nukes. Unless everyone here is very, very much unlike me or very much younger, they'll have had the fear in their life that one day a madman or a mad regime will get hold of a nuclear weapon. Well, you're about to find out what that feels like. 
And now that's where we can say that's not their internal affair. Iran has sworn repeatedly before every international body, the European Union, the UN, the International Atomic Energy Authority, it doesn't seek nuclear weapons, but it's lied. It's been caught lying. It's developing them very fast. It's going to use them for nuclear blackmail, not against Israel, in my opinion, but against neighboring Gulf Sunni states like Bahrain, which it will claim as its Kuwait. And then it will say, we walk into your country, what are you going to do? What's the West going to do? What's the UN going to do now they know we've got nukes? I was in, sorry if I bang on about this, but I think it's very important. I was in Beirut the other day. I got into a punch up with the Hezbollah, the Iranian client um, in the region. The Hezbollah, their, their election rallies, they lost very badly in Lebanon, by the way, I was pleased to see, as I think they did in Iran, by the way, if the truth were known. <clears throat> but you couldn't help noticing at the election rally that the Hezbollah symbol now is a nuclear mushroom cloud. That's the party symbol with some Islamic words written underneath that uh, I hardly need to translate to you. Now remember, the Iranian regime still says it doesn't seek nuclear weapons. That's still its official public position, but they forgot to tell Hezbollah that was the, that was the line. <laughs> and indeed, when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad um, the other day presided over the launching of some missiles that they were testing, he said, by the way, this also vindicates our nuclear program, again, forgetting in public, as president, you're not supposed to admit that. Um, they've solemnly sworn they, they don't. So among, among the crimes that would be committed if they were allowed to get nuclear weapons is no international law of any kind or any resolution of any international body would be worth a dime if they could tear it up that easily and just laugh at us. So the question is one for, not for me, but for everyone, or for the president, but for everyone in this room. Which do you think is worse? That the mullahs get a bomb after the way they've behaved to their own people and to their neighboring countries, and the way they intend to go on doing so, or that they be told that they can't have a bomb and that we'd accept the logical and probable consequences in either case. You don't have to answer now, but you do have to ask yourself. There's a question here that asks if, if you were to wear a, a button defining your politics, what would it be? <laughs> and, I, and I should note you are, in fact, wearing something on your lapel this evening. Our, our radio listeners can't see that. So maybe ah, you could... that this is the flag of the uh, largest uh, people in the world who don't have a state of their own, the, the Kurds. There are 40 million Kurds, we think, in, in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, some in Lebanon. Also. It's the largest national ethnic group that doesn't have a state. Uh, the, the Kuwaiti royal family has its own vote at the United Nations. The Kurds, uh, with 40 million, don't have any representation at all. So I wear it in solidarity with them and in solidarity with the, the autonomy that they've managed to build in um, liberated uh, northern Iraq. Now, you've written that the next Middle East war involving Israel, Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah <coughs> will take place on Lebanese soil. You mentioned that uh, you yes. just in Beirut. So do you see any way in avoiding this? Or? Well, the dress rehearsal of it has already taken place there uh, with, with, uh, via Hamas and uh, via Hezbollah. Uh, the encouraging thing in Lebanon, at any rate, is that there are, there's a majority, and it was proved again the other day, that believes in civil society, separation of religion from state, good relations with Europe and America, free press, unveiled women, um, and no private militias within the state, only one national army. And they don't want a Hezbollah private Shia militia that's armed and trained by a foreign power, and all that goes with that. So we have to make it our business, I think, to make it plain to people like that that we are on their side and they needn't be in any doubt of it. Now, are we sure that that is what they in fact think or are in fact hearing from Washington? I'm not at all certain that it is. It's a shift in geography now, but staying within the axis uh, of evil. Uh, what about the two journalists in, who are being held in North Korea? What can be done to free them? Well, like everybody else in this drama in Korea, uh, those young ladies are hostages. Um, everyone in North Korea is a hostage by definition. They're, they're slaves of the state. They're disposable robots and treated and considered as such. Um, but un unfortunately, so are the South Korean population because, as most of you will know, the capital city of uh, South Korea, now at last, uh, after a lot of struggle, the um, capital city of a democracy, Seoul, is very, very near the border with North Korea. And it's believed 
by good judges that North Korea could destroy the capital city, Seoul, <coughs> in a matter of hours, just by saturating it with conventional fire, of which it has enormous batteries stacked next to the border. So that we, if we were to decide to denuclearize the increasingly promiscuous North Korean testing grounds and proving grounds, which we could do in an afternoon ourselves, a very easy thing to take out North Korea's nukes. We don't know that they wouldn't be crazy enough to destroy millions of their fellow countrymen in the South as a revenge. So everyone's a prisoner. Everyone's in a stick-up with a mad hijacker. And no one's willing to call this person's bluff. Now, I don't think this can go on for very much longer. Something has to give in this. Why do I say that? Well, one more such test, either of a missile or a bomb, by North Korea, and the Japanese will say, that's it. We can go nuclear, too. We know they can. The Japanese have all the resources. They, they have all the stuff for a bomb. It's in, it's in different corners of the room. They just have to pass the resolution of their parliament, amend their constitution, put the pieces together. Does China want to nuclearize Japan, facing a nuclearized North Korea? Do we? Do we you can see where this is going. Wh which, is the, which is the greater risk? I'll tell you what I think from the experience of Iraq and other things. Putting it off, putting the confrontation off, makes it worse. It means it's going to be much more horrible when it does come. What, what surprised you when uh, you went to North Korea? What did you find that you didn't expect to find? Well, as I say, the, the awful thing was the confirmation of the, of the cliché. I mean, the, and again, the way that they, they, they commit what the Anglican Church um, calls uh, acts of supererogation, in other words, doing things they don't really have to do. You're, the first thing they tell you when you arrive is, don't make eye contact with anyone on the street. Don't try and talk to a North Korean. Don't try and strike up a conversation. Now, I don't speak Korean, and they knew that. <laughs> Very few North Koreans speak English. In any case, it was painfully evident that everyone in North Korea had already got that bulletin. Because they wouldn't look, they wouldn't make eye contact, they wouldn't agree, to, they wouldn't look at it. Some children would, because they didn't know or they hadn't, they hadn't taken yet. But, so the, it was too, it was unnecessarily crude of them to tell me not to do something that I wasn't able to do in any case, that they'd made sure I couldn't do. And it's not the way that you charm your visiting. Um, <laughs> after all, to get there, I'd, I'd had to pretend to be a fan of the regime. Uh, so that was a pretty rough. I did not see this happen, but a friend of mine swears to it. Getting tired of, you can't go to the opera, can't go to the TV, you can't go, no movies, nothing except long live the dear leader. He went to the zoo just to have a walk around the park. And there were some animals, rather morose, half-starved animals, but there they were. And they got to the parrot section, and there was a big parrot looked at him in a sort of beady way. And he looked at the parrot in a rather morose manner. And after a short interval, the, peril, the parrot opened its beak and said, long live the dear leader, Kim Ilson. <laughs> <clears throat> the only comment it felt able to make. I don't know, but I, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I didn't see it, I can't swear to it, but I don't disbelieve it. Well, here's someone who would like to know, wouldn't North Korea be more productive if they fed their people? Well, that's, a, that's, you see, that's a good question because it's a dilemma from which we rescue them. It's what I mean by hostage blackmail. The North Koreans uh, do their tests um, when they're in famine. They say, if you want us to stop testing, we insist that you supply us with uh, five million tons of grain. Now, we can always say, we won't do that. You, let you, you treat your people like this, you starve them to build nukes, you feed them. Use your own bloody brain. Fine, so then it's on our conscience that the people start to work. They bet, and they've so far bet correctly, we will, A, go back to the talks, having been insulted by the na latest test of the bomb and the missile, and we'll give them the grain. And we stencil on the grain the stars and stripes, and it says in Korean, a gift from the people of the United States. It's, so they can't give it out any other way. And they do. And they say, you see, so powerful and beloved is the dear leader that the United States pays him a regular tribute. 
just out of respect and fear of his majesty, of his wonder. And there's no reason to doubt, or there hasn't until recently been much reason to doubt, that people believe that's true. We're now getting a few more defectors from North Korea. Uh, it's not as hermetic as it used to be. But what they, what they were telling us until recently is, yes, everyone does actually believe the state propaganda. What about... So the question was, what if they were to feed their people, would they do better? It doesn't arise. We do that for them. And they couldn't do it if they wanted to, because they're, they're the only thing that works after a while in a totalitarian system. This happened in, in, in Iraq, too. The only thing that works. You can't put a Band-Aid on the oil rigs. You can't do a thing about the pumps. You can't do a thing about the, the generators. But the secret police and the army go on working till the end. Now, at the beginning of your, your talk, you uh, gave a very moving description of uh, uh, a, a man who had suffered torture in, in Iraq. Here's, here's a, a question uh, from someone in the audience who would like you to comment further on the quality of information obtained by torture and uh, also would like you to consider the confessions obtained by the, from the Bulgarian nurses by the Libyan government. Uh, who allegedly infected people with the AIDS virus, injected people with the AIDS virus. Well, the Bulgarian case, which I've studied a bit, um, does remind one of inquisitional type tortures, the tortures of Christian um, Europe, uh, sanctioned by the papacy, where it was just a question of how much can you get people to say. It was kind of a game. You know. Did you, in fact, change yourself into a vixen at the full moon and... Um, poison the crops and so forth. Yes, I did. You can make people say that. Are you hermaphrodite? Yes. Um, that kind of thing. The people who waterboarded me actually once at one point said, uh, we can get you to say you're a hermaphrodite if we want. And I realized they quite... I don't know how I look to people suddenly. Um, <laughs> they quite possibly could. Uh, but... But that, of course, is, is too lenient, is too easy an objection to torture. I mean, the, there is a big objection to torture, and otherwise there would be no moral problem about it, which is it can get real information. Of course it can. Not for long, I think. I think the well becomes tainted, and I think diminishing returns would, get, would be hit quite quickly. But yes, um, if it didn't produce results, if it didn't get people to loosen their tongues, there would be nothing to object to about it. Well, one of our audience members would like to follow up on your, your question since you mentioned waterboarding. Why did you make the decision to, to do that? Well, because I thought that um, there'd been enough argument on every side of the case about uh, should torture be used, uh, are there exceptions, is it torture anyway? within the real meaning of the act, does it violate the Geneva Convention, and so forth, that, that that was becoming boring. It was becoming a routine argument. And so the only way I could think of of breaking into the argument and trying to reopen it was to subject myself to it and say, well, or have myself subjected to it, rather, and see what that taught me, which was actually quite a lot. So what did your colleagues and uh, family say when you, uh, when, when you told them that you were going to do that? Well, they were slightly, I mean, I, I have to give you the most uh, truthful answer, um, as I've said to my interrogators. Um, um, I, I owe you the best answer I can give you. Um, I'm slightly surprised to get my letter of the night before saying, just in case, here's what I want done. Because I'd had to sign a paper that pointed out to me that you could very easily die from this. Um, not from drowning, though, by the way, don't believe what they say to you, um, that it, it's a regular thing in the New York Times, the waterboarding simulates drowning. It doesn't simulate drowning, it is drowning, except in slow motion. It's the real thing. But because of that, you can get a stroke or um, a seizure or heart attack. And I'm 60 now. So I had to be indemnified against all this. So I thought, well, I'd better make some provision and preparation. So I wrote to Carol and said, just in case. I think she hadn't expected to get that. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I, nor had I been expecting to send such a message for, for a Vanity Fair assignment. But there you go. These are, <laughs> these are strange times.
60 seems like a, a good age to write a memoir, and in fact, rumor has it that you're at work on one. Oh. Is there uh, any, any juicy stuff that we can look forward sure. to? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you spend a lot of time traveling to exotic <laughs> places. Nice try. <laughs> When, when, when's it in the works, by the way? When, when should we uh, look for it's it? In the, the, it's books. in the works, all right. It's in the works, all right. Uh, so where, where, are you, where are you headed for next? What's next on the, the travel itinerary? Poland. Um, which is actually to do with the memoir. I, I, I want to go and look at the landscape where my mother's family came from. The sort of howling wilderness wasteland that was once Germany and is now Poland, that border that kept moving so inopportunely and so horribly for so many people and um, I've been to Warsaw but um, and other parts of Poland but I for a long time didn't know exactly which strip of land my ancestry came from so I want to go and look at that and see what what thoughts are prompted by it well from Poland let's hop back across the border to uh, the former Czechoslovakia for a moment so when you were in Prague what did they charge you with? Did they plant narcotics in your suitcase like they did to Jacques Derrida, or the what did they charge, come up with? The charge, if they had um, made it, would have been hooliganism. <laughs> we were told. Um, because it sounds so awful. Um, and because it's, it can cover almost anything. But it, uh, it consisted of attending a meeting in a private apartment um, and bringing printed materials in there and so forth. But, we were told um, that that was what we'd get if we, um, if we continued to object. In the end, we were just deported, a deportation stamp put in the passport. In your opinion, would the world be a better place, more peaceful, organized, and civilized if organized religion did not exist? Yeah. <laughs> Bien, bien sûr, it would, yes, uh, it would. And, and, and one audience member wants to know, which religion or belief system do you find the least repulsive? Well, no, it's a good question because I do say, and I, I don't just do it to have a provocative subtitle, that religion poisons everything, and people say often when I go and speak or debate on religious sites and campuses and holy territories and so forth. You mean everything, I mean chess, uh, <laughs> Italian cuisine and so on. And I say, actually, yes, because it insults us in our deepest um, integrity by saying that we wouldn't know where right and wrong came from if it wasn't for a divine permission. And we wouldn't have a meaning to life if it wasn't by supernatural uh, determination. In, the, in other words, that we would be uh, like the inhabitants of someone like North Korea or Iran, children of, a, of an intolerant and greedy... Um, a narrow-minded uh, deity. So yes, that would spoil everything. Um, but by the way, chess is banned um, by, in, in Iran, where they can ban it. Um, because the whole point about totalitarianism is it abolishes the private life and any private recreation. So yes, I do mean it seriously. But now, for example, my daughter goes to a Quaker school. Do I really say that the Quakers are the same? Well, they make the same mistake, which is that they think that faith is uh, a word that deserves approbation. If I could change one thing about the discourse in this country, just one, it would be we would stop nodding approvingly when people say, I'm a person of faith. Yeah. <laughs> because what are you nodding at? The guy who you know is a glib asshole for saying it in the first place <laughs> would, even if he was a sincere asshole, would be saying... I hope you like the fact that I'm willing to take an enormous amount of very important stuff completely on trust without any evidence of any kind. I say, I'm not going to admire that. I think that stinks. So, and I'm afraid uh, 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 the Quakers are just as guilty of saying that faith is a, a good thing, whereas, in fact, it's the most overrated of the virtues, if it's a virtue at all. This may or may not be a related question. Have you ever hiked the Appalachian Trail or been to Argentina? <laughs> Argentina I've done, and there's, a very, and there's a very odd bit of the Appalachian Trail near um, the Horsatonic River in Connecticut, 
where I had a brief stroll um, <laughs> on the 4th of July, 1977, until the mood for exercise left me again. <laughs> but Argentina, Argentina, Argentina changed my life. Argentina, big deal, Argentina. How so? Well, I was there during the, what's now called historically the Dirty War, um, the, the period where the death squads, the Escuadrones de la, de la Muerte, were roaming the streets of Buenos Aires and picking people up, and the word desaparecido came into our language, the disappeared, using the disappeared as a verb. He's been disappeared, or she's been disappeared. And watching that and... Um, uh, interviewing some of the people who'd been victims of it and then meeting some of the people who'd been doing it was a huge thing for me. And, um, well, one, one, you say, why did it change my life? Well, the article I wrote about it for the New Statesman, my old socialist journal in London, made Victor Navasky of The Nation write to me and say, did I want to have a job at The Nation in New York? And I said, yes. So it changed my life in that way, and then the other way it changed my life was when Mrs. Thatcher sent the fleet to bombard and overthrow these scumbags. I was on her side, which I never expected to be. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where would history be without ironies, and why would it be worth studying? Well, speaking of history, you've written a pretty compelling article recently calling for the return of the Elgin marbles. Elgin. El Elgin marbles. They're not Tanqueray. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even Gordon's. <laughs> now, well, you'll, now you'll remember. We'll get some other questions yeah. about drink later. So do you think it'll happen in your lifetime? Yes. I'm sure it will. Now, the other day, just after, not just after, not, not of course because, but just The Guardian a newspaper in London, very well read paper, one of the last not to have gone tabloid, had a poll. Um, it very much surprised me. It was almost Saddam Hussein-like. Should they go back to Athens or not? 97% said yes. I was surprised by that. I knew the majority had been going up. For most people, the argument's completely over. For the obvious reason that um, if, say, uh, the panel of the Mona Lisa had been sawn in half during the Napoleonic Wars, which it could easily have been, many artworks were, and one bit of it was in, the, in St. Petersburg, say, and one in Lisbon, there'd be a very big demand, I think, now, to see what they'd look like if they were put together. Well, this applies in immeasurably more intensely to the sculpture of Phidias, which is a, an architectural narrative um, and a poetic one rendered in marble uh, with figures interacting with each other and telling a story. It's, it makes no sense at all that this should be amputated or partitioned um, and the other half imprisoned in a colonial museum in Bloomsbury. We have a number of questions, curiously enough, about your, your favorite things. Um, one wants to know things you can't live without when traveling, and one person, one well-informed audience member, of course, wants to know what your favorite whiskey is. Well, I don't see what the difference between the two questions. <laughs> <laughs> The favorite blended, the best blended scotch in the history of the world, which was also the favorite drink of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party, um, as it is still of the Palestinian Authority and the Libyan dictatorship and m large branches of the Saudi Arabian royal family, Johnny Walker Black, <laughs> breakfast of champions, except no, <laughs> except no substitutes. Well, here's, uh, here, here's a a question that about religion again, about religion and climate change. How do you see religion affecting or being affected by climate change? Well, I've noticed that um, the more flooding there is, <laughs> the more bullshit gets taught. <laughs> I mean, it, it was very noticeable in the Asian tsunami. Um, Sri Lanka, which is a country I know a little bit and care about, they, everyone said, it happened, as you remember, around Christmas, New Year. The Buddhists said we knew this would happen because of the horrible mu Muslim slaughter practices. So it was amazing to see how apocalypse or catastrophe makes people behave primitively. The same happens with earthquakes. It will happen when the next big earthquake hits Iran. The, will be, it'll be very interesting to see because it's coming like Christmas, that earthquake, by the way. It's coming like a heart attack. Whether the government gets blamed for spending all its resources on nuclear weapons and building underground bunkers 
by the way, those nukes will be in underground bunkers when the earthquake hits, just the place where you want them to be. Or whether people will say it's because we haven't been sufficient in our devotions to Allah. But there will be those rival schools. There were British bishops in the later flooding in London um, who said that it was because Tony Blair had legalized homosexuality. <laughs> this kind of um, cretinism is incurable. <laughs> but unfortunately, for those of us who take the warming threat seriously, um, that means we're going to have to put up with more of it as there's more inundation. Well, at least for this evening, we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Too much. So thank you very much, Christopher Hitchens. Thanks for having me.